Lord God, we invite you this morning to rain down upon us. Lord, this has been a difficult time in our culture, in our nation. But Lord, I pray you would lift up our spirits as we come to you, the God of, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That Lord, we would have your joy, we would have the assurance that you are not you are not undone by all these things, but Lord, you are in control. You are the God who promised. You are the God who created all things by the power of your word. And we pray that word would be our food. It would be our drink. It would be our joy this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. For those of you who follow the lectionary, you may... Notice that today's for, uh, scripture readings were from last week. The gospel was the same for both weeks. But I, in praying about this, and especially with everything going on, I, just, I felt the Lord was saying to deal with the passage in, in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at that today. I think it's really an encouragement to us as to what we have in Christ Jesus. In 2017, uh, Ben Fielding and, and Reuben Morgan wrote the music and the words to a song, Who You Say I Am. It was released in 2018 by Hillsong. And I love the words to the songs, and sometimes I like to just let them reverberate throughout my head and my mind. And contained in these words is the joy of the gospel message. For those who have been set free from the death, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this truth has never been more relevant than today. Knowing who we are in Christ cannot be taken away by legislation or threat, because God has revealed through His Word our identity. And I want to share with you verse 1 and the refrain of this song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, he's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I believe that it's vitally important for Christians to know who they are because of who, whose they are and what he has done for them. Those who have come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and decided to follow him wherever he leads, no matter what's going on, should expect the enemy to attempt to challenge and to attempt to discourage and do it at every turn. Whenever that liar attempts to place doubt in our minds that we are a child of God, that we can say without fear or doubt that I am chosen. I've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. I am who he says I am. I am chosen of God, not forsaken. God is for me, not against me. Amen? Amen. What a wonderful declaration of faith and of praise to the living God who is the Lord over all creation. It's a wonderful song of praise, and it has its roots in our epistle reading from the book of Ephesians that we read this morning. We read, we read Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, which taught properly would take 12 to 14 weeks minimum. But today we're going to briefly consider Paul's opening words to the church in Ephesus from Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. But first, let's identify Paul's purpose in writing this section to the church at Ephesus. He begins with, of course, identifying himself and his apostolic authority, and, and that the Christians in Ephesus are those to whom he is writing. And then he bursts forth in a doxology of praise, praise to God in verses 3 to 14. When we read this section in our Bible, it's, it appears to be seven or eight verses, depending on our sentences, depending on, on the translation that you see. And it has a series of commas breaking up those sentences into a, a readable narrative. It breaks into three sections. 
prays to the electing father in verses 3 to 6, to the redeeming son in verses 7 to 12, and to the sealing spirit in verses 13 to 14. However, in the Greek, the verses 3 to 14 are one long sentence of worship and praise to the intimate union God has established between himself and his chosen, those who are forgiven and sealed and can rely on that promise. Some have suggested that Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14 is a wonderful summary of all of Paul's theology. David Guzik in his commentary on, the, on, on Ephesians suggests, as an opera has an overture, setting the tone for all the melodies that will follow, so Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 sets the tone for the rest of Ephesians. You know, when we come together to worship the Lord, we have singing. We have readings from God's Word. We have singing. We have the sermon, the confession of faith, prayer, repentance, and then singing. The offertory, the, the opening of the liturgy, the sursum corda, and singing. The Lord's Supper, communion and, and pr communion prayer, and singing. I must confess that I've become so used to that that I, stopped, I had to stop to think, why do we do that? This week I focus on what Paul's reason might be for opening most of his letters with what can be seen as a doxology. Every part of our services should remind us of all that God has done for us in Christ. It should cause us to rejoice no matter what's going on. James Montgomery Boyce wrote this in his commentary on Ephesians. The sermon is important. We learn from the sermon, but the doctrine, if rightly understood, leads to doxology. If we discover who God is and what he has done for us, we will praise him. Let me give you an example of how a very ordinary part of life given to God in praise can bring to the, us the heart of God and, and changes and that what we're doing is and, and to an offering of praise. For many years, I, I went to the gym several days a week. Even when I was on the road, I knew where those little Quonset huts, those little old buildings were. You could pull in there and, and my truck while I was waiting to be loaded or unloaded and I could work out. And it's a place where all these, you know, these guys who are really into this. I liked it because it was free and it was close to where I was. Lifting weights hurt, but I used to call it a good hurt because I, I knew it was worth it and, and the evidence was there and how I looked, how I felt and my energy level. I used to find it amusing that every gym that I went to had two things in common. They had mirrors around the wall so the guys could admire themselves or turn around wishing they hadn't seen that. And they also had music and it wasn't lullabies. It wasn't soft music, easy listening. It was usually loud and it was the kind of music that made you kind of have some energy and want to work out. Well, I still work out and it still hurts. Just not good like before, but like I need three ibuprofen kind of a hurt. But I've realized like before, I needed to discipline myself to do it for the benefit of it. I've lost weight. I feel better. And I feel like what I'm doing is worth it even though it hurts. To be honest, for a long time I felt the same way about the church. I went because it benefited me and I assumed it brought me closer to God. I don't feel that way now. And I know it's not because God changed. It's because I did. The Word of God through the power and the witness of the Holy Spirit has transformed my understanding of God and how He loved and blessed me through Jesus Christ my Lord. I love to sing songs to Him 
I love to praise him. I love to praise him in prayer. I love to praise him by feeding upon his word. And this is a large part of what Paul was writing to teach the church in Ephesus. Over the past 20 years, we have seen our beloved country continue to decline, walk further and further away from the standard of belief wherein we were originally formed. And the foundation that we were built upon was the laws of God and the authority of his word. As we have walked further and further away from that standard, we have declined in our morals. We've become deeply fractured along cultural and ideological beliefs and all but cease to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I wanted to mention this because the past few months have shown us a drastic decline due to these things. And my intention this morning is not to reflect on the current political or social climate, but to point out that during Paul's time, the church in Ephesus and all the Christian churches in Asia Minor, all those churches were the vast minority, the new kids on the block. And yet in time of danger and persecution, the church of Jesus Christ flourished. Ephesus was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. And it's among the top five cities of that empire in the first century. Ephesus was considered the most glorious of the cities. And the temple of goddess, uh, the goddess Artemis or Diana was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. The Apostle Paul stayed there in Ephesus for two to three years, planting a church and raising up leaders there. It became the center for evangelism for the western part of Asia Minor. It's important to realize this because Paul had originally gone into a very dangerous environment, dangerous for him as a, as a Christian, speaking things that were un, uncommon to them and to some blasphemous. He took with him Priscilla and Aquila. But with him, more importantly than that, and the most important thing, is he took with them the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power to be found in the name of Jesus Christ. It opened all the doors. It made everything work. Even in the midst of chaos and persecution, the church flourished. And it's important to note that he was writing to a thriving Christian community from prison. Paul was in danger the whole time he was in Ephesus. He was imprisoned there. And now years later, he's still writing from prison, but he's writing a letter of joy and of praise, encouraging them to sustain the faith. And like in his letter to the Romans, Ephesians gives us a window into Paul's theology. Unlike many of his letters, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus at a time when he's not having to address a local crisis or some serious spiritual problem. What makes this letter stands out is that it contemplates the mystery of God's relationship with the church. He presents the church as God's new humanity where his people can have a foretaste of what a renewed relationship with God in Christ is like. It points to the renewed unity and the renewed dignity that God intended for us to have from the very beginning. And that's why Paul knew it was important to begin with praising this God to worshiping him. It's the foundation of all that we were and all that we are. And if we want to be complete and find out who we are, it will come by bowing down in praise and honor and glory to our creator. Praise refocuses our lives and our attention to the glory, the majesty, and the wonder of God. And that's where Paul chooses to begin the letter to the Ephesians. So let's read Ephesians 1, 3 to 4.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The first order of worship, prayer, or any action of life should be to acknowledge that God is worthy of our praise and honor and glory. There is no true sa sacred secular dichotomy. We must always remember that God is the first cause of all things good and wonderful, whether it be at work, at play, in business, in relationships, in anything in our culture, what music, art, whatever, and certainly within the church. We should praise him for who he is, the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is everything to us. Our salvation, our hope, our wisdom, our joy, our provision, our healer, our defender, and the only way to the Father and the only way to a true life as it was meant to be. It comes through Jesus Christ as God the Father who has made that possible. It's because of the blessing of the Father who sent his Son as the atonement for our sins that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, I love this. Our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They're more than we deserve. But our thanks ought to go to God in thunders of high hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better than being the heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for our portion is blessed, infinitely, infinitely more blessed than our own brood acres of land. God hath blessed us with spiritual blessings. They are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings, and they are priceless in value. Throughout the entire section, verses 3 to 14, Paul was saying that the blessings listed come from God the Father, become ours in Jesus Christ, and are applied to us by the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the subject of every verb in the section. And the phrase in Christ or in him occurs throughout. It's not something you or I did. It's the gift of theirs to us. It's a wonderful example of the workings of the Trinity on behalf of those who are in Christ. There are two ways to understand what Paul meant by spiritual blessings. He could be speaking of spiritual as opposed to physical blessings, or that the blessings come to us by means of the Holy Spirit, which he affirms in verse 14. But I suspect that the first meaning applies to verse 3. We're meant to have an intimate relationship with our Creator and to know Him more fully every day, forever. There should be no end of that. We should hunger for that because that is our greatest need. No matter what you feel your greatest need is right now, it's not that. It's Jesus Christ. To have no desire to receive God's blessings is really to live at the level of animals. Animals' soul activities are eating and sleeping, entertaining themselves and, and reproducing. Now, even though these are activities that are part of the human life, we were created for something much higher and with much greater purpose. We're made in the image of God, and we're to join Him in subduing the earth and having dominion over it. The goal was to make the earth a, a place for God to dwell with us, for heaven and earth to come together as a place where God, is, His glory is revealed and that we uh, delight in Him and enjoy Him forever for all of eternity. That was, the, that was God's intention in Eden. And Paul wanted this understanding to be an encouragement to the church that needed to press forward with the gospel message. God was willing to not only pour out spiritual blessings, but to bless us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. We cannot even imagine what all that can contain. Did you know that? Do you want that? Are you praying for that? What we are witnessing in our culture right now 
is the effect that ignoring and even rejecting God's spiritual blessings can have, and not just with the world, but it's within the church as well. We, we don't get off the hook. Many of us have witnessed many women acting like animals in their rage and deception as they riot, destroying property, looting, and starting fires, and killing. There is no hope for this to stop through legislation, but only through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The government, no matter who is president, can never accomplish this, and they were never intended to. It is and has always been the call of the people of God, the church, only a revival and an, a powerful awakening of the Holy Spirit can save this country, but it will take God's people praying for God to pour out all of the spiritual blessings upon his people in America. It's literally the only hope we have. In 1876, Robert Lowry wrote the hymn, Nothing But the Blood. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. The lyrics are powerful, but I just want to share with you the refrain. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Years ago, I met a man named Ron Dupree, who had once been the sergeant of arms with uh, uh, Los Angeles Hells Angels. He had a black belt in karate and was state champion of Arizona and California. He was around 6'3 and probably went 270 and what a lot of fat on him. The motorcycle club called him loco because he was so violent and he was so dangerous. No one wanted to, to have loco go off on them. There was simply no taming him. But when I met him, I heard the testimony of how Jesus Christ did. As I stood talking to him, I was incredibly grateful that Jesus had. He was now a man of love and humility who wanted to share the story of how Jesus Christ had transformed his life. It didn't happen because of a government program. It did not happen because he was entitled to something. He knew, he came to know he was entitled to nothing. His sin has separated him from God. And for he knew who he was. You could not look at him and tell who he had been, though. But he knew. And he's eternally grateful to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for changing his life. His motorcycle brothers could not believe the transformation, but they were not going to make fun of him either. <laughs> We've been settling for far less than what God is willing to pour out upon us. And now's the time to acknowledge that upon our knees. Why would he hear us? and grant our request. I think it's cause he's been waiting for his people to ask him because they've come to the end of their own strength and abilities. I think we might be there. Paul assures us that God is willing because that's what he had planned before the foundations of the world. Let's read Ephesians 1, 4 again even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, we should not attempt to change what Paul has written here. He makes it clear that believers are chosen by God. And they are chosen before they were ever even a thought to their mother and father. They were chosen before God created the heavens and the earth, before they had a chance to do anything to justify themselves before him. There are many who find this offensive. This great, the great light of this truth for them seems to cast a shadow, namely to reconcile human responsibility with divine sovereignty. God's decisions are his own. And the purpose of this light is not to cast shadows, but to guide our steps. The light of God's choosing us, it gives us assurance as to the authority of his plan and ensures his love towards us. The reasons for God's choosing us are not capricious, 
nor are they random. Paul wrote in another doxology of praise in Romans chapter 11, 33 to 36, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Oh, who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Though God's plans and choices are not known to us, we know that they're altogether wise and good, but the reasons are all in Him, not in us. However, the fact that the Bible teaches this is undeniable. John R. W. Stott calls God's choosing a divine revelation, not human speculation. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones refers to this teaching as statement, not an argument. Paul gives the reason that God chose his people, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We're not just cho chosen only for salvation, but also for holiness. And any understanding of God's sovereign choosing that diminishes our personal responsibility or personal holiness or sanctification falls far short of the whole counsel of God. Having saved us, he places within us the Holy Spirit that we might be able to follow the commands of God that we were previously unable to because of our spiritual blindness and the darkness of our hearts. In verse 5, we, under, we understand why he chose and what it meant for those in Christ. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. That's the Father's destiny for His chosen, that they would enjoy adoption as sons and daughters. God's unfolding plan for us not only includes salvation, but personal transformation, and also a warm and a confident relationship with the Father. When the Apostle Paul wrote about adoption, it must be noted that he was a Roman citizen and he was writing to churches in the Roman Empire who were, uh, had to uh, adhere to Roman law. In the first century, when a man was adopted by a family, and it was usually a young man who had been watched for a long time by a family, a man in a family who did not have an heir. He'd been chosen by someone who's looking for an heir and will continue the family, even though he had not born, was not born into that family. Once adopted, he had no more identity with his birth family. He had become the heir of all that the adopted father owned. The transfer was complete, and a new identity was given. That's what God predestined for those he chooses to adopt. And John R. W. Stott made this observation. This high position in the family of God gives us something in Jesus that Adam never had. When people ask us the speculative question why God went ahead with the creation when he knew that it would be followed by the fall, one answer we can tentatively give is that he destined us for a higher dignity than even creation could bestow upon us. It was something we didn't deserve. It was something he gave. That brings us back full circle to why God has lavished his love upon his beloved. And it's so that we can be the image bearers that we were originally intended to be. He writes, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us and the beloved. This family aspect is, a point, is pointed to us again. We're designed for the joy of praising the God of who, who he is, for who he is, and, when, and what he's done, and because of the grace and love. The word for blessed here is, is chariot. It's, it's the same that the angel Gabriel used in his initial greeting to the Virgin Mary. It means highly favored, full of grace. And Paul is saying that this is granted to every believer. And why would he do that? Don't you imagine that Mary asked the question, why me? Early 4th century church, uh, early church father, John Chrysostom, when speaking of this work by which God makes us blessed and the beloved, said it is as if we were to take a leper and change him into a lovely youth. This is the point that the apostle Paul wanted the Ephesians to grasp. 
There were so many reasons to sing the praises of God, and I don't know that we'll ever realize just how true that is. Not this side of heaven. But none is more important than praising Him because of His unmerited favor and His grace. It's time we, t we take our intended place within the family and go looking for those who don't know about grace and mercy from God. There's not a greater way to praise the Lord than by acting in love and obedience to His grace lavished on us. Brothers and sisters, the world needs to know that there's a loving God. There's also the reality of hell. If you behold the one, you assure the other. We have our work cut out. We can't see people stamped, elect. We're told to evangelize. We're told to go after all those that God cherishes. Let's be faithful to our Father, to His will, and to our Savior's sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you this morning humbled by your word. Lord, somehow we are inclined to be a bit arrogant in thinking there's some reason why, why we are Christians because, well, we, we met a standard that you said, okay, you're what I'm looking for. But Lord, we did not, and you came after us anyway. I don't know why, but I thank you. I praise you. I worship you. I adore you. I pray, Lord, that this word, this doxology of Paul from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 would resonate in our heart. It would cause us to fall upon our knees in thanksgiving and honor and glory and praise. For you are the loving God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.